Hello and welcome back to Coming Home Network Presents, where we have conversations about the kind of things that people wrestle with when they're exploring the Catholic Church and wondering if they should become a part of it. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network. Please come visit us at chnetwork.org. And especially if you're looking for support uh, from others who are going through situations like the ones that you might be going through, uh, please check out our online community. That's community.chnetwork.org. And we make all this possible because of generous people who want to help you and support you on your journey. And if you want to join that group of generous people, go to chnetwork.org slash donate. So at the Coming Home Network, we work with a lot of people, but the core group we work with is what we call primaries. Um, those are people, I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, who could lose their job if they start getting too serious about exploring the Catholic faith. And usually when we say that, uh, people automatically think of Protestant pastors uh, but that can also include music ministers, it can also include youth pastors, it can include missionaries, and even, as we'll find out tonight, lay people teaching at private Christian elementary, middle, and high schools from various Protestant traditions. So, my guests tonight actually have, I think, at least three things in common. Um, first of all, both of them taught in private Christian schools and uh, found themselves in those kinds of situations. Uh, second, both of them have shared their stories on the journey home, and you can find the links to those episodes in the show notes. And then third of all, I think they both have similar nicknames in the classroom. Um, I'm joined now by Dr. Annie Bullock, known in some educational circles as Dr. B, and uh, Matthew Dantuono, known in certain educational circles as Mr. D. So Annie and Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. All right. So we won't get into the full narrative arc of your stories, but let's get into at least a little bit of where you were in Christian education uh, when things got serious and you started exploring Catholicism. So I'll start with you, uh, Annie. Um, what kind of teaching situation were you in when you started to really think um, that you might want to become Catholic? I know for you it was kind of like a, a slow burn, but, yeah. but where were you when it really started to, to catch fire? Yeah, so I it was a really... A slow, long process. But when we really started to get serious about it and when I felt like I was a little bit stuck, I guess, was when I was teaching at um, a school that it was classical and Christian, uh, sort of a non-denominational school, uh, but it was founded by a group of people who were Presbyterian, um, PCA. So very conservative, kind of reformed perspective. And I was teaching theology. I also taught some history and literature classes, but primarily I was teaching theology because that's what my my degrees are in, so um, 10th and 11th grade, mostly. How about you, Matt? Where were you teaching when this all kind of came to a head? I was at a private Christian school, Protestant school, right? Uh, you know, so it, it used to bug me when kids would say, I used to be Catholic and now I'm Christian. Like, well, actually, you know, so, uh, but yeah, uh, actually related a reformed based school and I was teaching math. And then my last year there, I only taught there three years. My last year there, I was also a class dean. My my bachelor's degree is in physics. And so um, they put me right into the math classes because that was the need, as there's always a need for math mm. and physics. Teachers. Well, that is a kind of a unique situation, especially in classical schools, but in any kind of like private religious schools, they're loaded up with like English and theology and like they can't find anybody to teach science and math. So this is... This is actually uh, a really great thing that you were you were able to fill that hole. Uh, but um, before we get into, well, actually, there are, there are several things. I have so many questions for you. Uh, let's start with this. Uh, what was it um, for you, uh, Doctor Bullock, that got you like steered in this direction? Because I, I, I believe, if I recall correctly from your story, you were you were sort of leaning in a Catholic direction and on a Catholic trajectory before you even got into Christian private education, right? Yes, I was, although I, I mean, I sort of knew that and I sort of didn't. I thought that I was leaning in a particular direction, but I has, had grown up Baptist and I was Anglican and I sort of thought Anglican was far enough. And looking back, I see I was leaning more and more Catholic, but I sort of thought, well, you know, I'm Anglican and I'm Protestant enough and this, this makes sense. And, and, and that's where, you know, that's kind of where I was. Well, you sort there's certain things you can't escape in the world of theology, but Matt, you were in a very safe world of physics and math. <laughs> so what was it that got you kind of steered in this path where you started taking seriously the possibility of, of the Catholic Church? When I first started teaching at the school, I was uh, I had been debating hotly with a Catholic. We had just met, he had emailed me, found my information on my college page, um, 
and I was I was vehemently anti-Catholic. But the the semester before I started teaching, I audited a class in New York City taught by Peter Kraft, and um, and I I'm sure my in-laws were horrified because I was with them. We were all together, and I asked him point blank at the dinner table, you know, because I knew that he had converted to Catholicism. I was like, "Isn't that a heresy?" You know, use faith in works, and he it was great. You know, we're all. I'm sure they were like, oh, my gosh, just be quiet, Matt. But he very graciously and very simply answered my question. I was like, oh, maybe it's not so bad after all. But I was still on a mission to, to disprove Catholicism. Uh, but, I saw, but I wasn't necessarily convinced that it was heresy at the time. But I was continuing to investigate because now the, the door was open. And, of course, it's intriguing. And I was still in debate so trying to prove my a debater wrong who is uh, Trent Beatty he's a, he does some some writing interviews and that sort of thing yeah, he's done a number of things especially for the National Catholic Register among others uh, he's yes. got some great interviews with with Catholic athletes and 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 the like but uh, so if there's a Catholic eavesdropping on us like a cradle Catholic who maybe has gone to 12 years of Catholic school um they might be a little bit like confused by this situation about why you entertaining these questions might possibly get you in trouble because um in a lot of Catholic schools, uh, even like really faithful, like Orthodox Catholic schools, you still have like a pretty decent chunk of faculty who are not necessarily practicing Catholic and they might sign a piece of paper, but the piece of paper says, I promise I won't actively teach anything that is in direct opposition to the Catholic faith. So it's a little bit different at the Christian schools that were in my world as an evangelical. So when it comes to a statement of faith, I mean, somebody might say, well, your Christian school, as long as you just don't teach anything against Reformed theology, you might be fine. But what kind of statement of faith were you called to um, sign, Annie, uh, as, a, as a part of, well, I mean, it's different for you as a theology faculty, but just as a yeah. faculty member in general. So the faculty all had to sign the same statement, and they made a distinction between what they called primary doctrine and secondary doctrine. And primary doctrine would be, they would say things that are contained in the Nicene Creed. And anything else would be considered secondary. So if you believe we should baptize adults and I think we should baptize infants, that's a secondary issue because I don't know. And I'm not sure how we would land on the Nicene Creed. It's one of the things that was confusing about my job. You mentioned Peter Kreeft. We taught Peter Kreeft. I mean, and I taught Aquinas. This is part of how I sort of found myself kind of getting in trouble with people and not really realizing it or really noticing or thinking, oh, wait, but this is like part of the curriculum. And... Um, but it was just too Catholic for some people. The rest of the statement of faith, there was another article in there that had to do with um, some social, cultural, behavioral kinds of things. Marriage is one man, one woman, this kind of thing that was also part of kind of the lifestyle you were expected to lead. And so that was also in there. But although they always keyed it to the Nicene Creed, it also had some language in there that was intended to rule out Catholics their slam dunk that they thought was going to keep all the Catholics out was the fact that they said that there were 66 books in the Bible. I believe in, in scripture is the inerrant word of God, and there are 66 books. And they thought, well, no Catholic would be able to sign that, so we're keeping them out. But that was something that it didn't matter if you were teaching second grade or you were teaching math or you were teaching theology. Everyone had to sign the same thing. Do you have anything like that at your school, Matt? Yeah, we had – it said on the contract that we signed – that we agreed to, and it was there were three reformed documents that we said we had to say we agreed with. Uh, one was the Heidelberg Catechism. I forget what the other two were, but I knew that there were other teachers there who were not uh, reformed. They were Baptist or Evangelical Protestant, non-denominational. Um, so I asked them. I didn't tell them what I was thinking about, but I asked them. I said, "Did you sign that?" And they said, "No," but they sub they submitted their own statement of faith. And apparently that was acceptable to them. So when I did not sign, I submitted my own statement of faith as well. Uh, the re and the reason I couldn't sign uh, was because one of the things was one of the those documents very clearly stated the number of books in the Bible. And I, you know, so uh, I knew I couldn't sign it. So I submitted my own statement of faith, which was pretty general. And uh, the board called me into a special meeting. They said, Matt, what's going on here? So I just, I told them where I stood. Uh, and, you know, up, leading up to that point, though, the principal in the school was a, a wonderful man. And I, I asked him, 
because by by the beginning of my third year, I was I was pretty convinced. I already signed my contract for the the year the previous spring, but I think by the fall of that that last year, I was pretty convinced of the truth of Catholicism. So I asked the principal. I said, um, "Are there any Catholics who work at this school?" And he told me no, and that whenever he had an applicant submitting a job resume, if it turned out that they were Catholic, he would have to say to them, "I'm sorry, we can't hire you." Some, there was something in the, I don't know, the foundation documents of the school that they could not have Catholics on staff. Um, and he, he was a wonderful man. And he had, he had a really hard time with the fact that the school let me go. He was quite upset. And he told me, and I appreciated that. But he, so I, I had sort of figured out where I, where I stood and I knew it was coming. By the way, strangely enough, Peter Kraft, he graduated from the school where I was teaching at the time. He graduated really? from there. So, Whoa. yeah, and he was like, he, he he was the one who must not be named. That's because wild. He converted to, he thought, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, because he was, what, Dutch Reformed or something like that? I got I to gotta go back and look at my notes. We have a whole database of these things at the Coming Home Network. Uh, but, uh, all right, so I want to back up a little bit because we're talking, I mean, we brought you up to the point at which, you know, you were, uh, you kind of had to bite the bullet and, and move on or be asked to to move on here. Uh, but let's let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the Christian intellect, because in some ways, it's kind of wild that this doesn't happen a whole lot more often. Um, it's kind of wild that, I mean, and I don't think it's because, I mean, I think it's similar to the case of, of Protestant pastors. I don't think it's because people aren't thinking about these things. I think there's like a culture in this world that says, well, there's just certain things that you can talk about in quiet, but and certain things that you just can't talk about out loud. Because in the case of theology, but also in the case of like you know, studying the history of natural sciences, uh, and you look at the, or, or history in general, like you look at the impact of the church on certain thoughts and ideas. And don't you think that, well, I'll start with you, Annie, because church history was a big part of your study. Do you, do you think it's natural for someone who's like a, like a serious, honest a uh, Christian who wants to de develop the life of the mind, that they're going to have to run into these Catholic ideas at some point? Yes, I do. I think that, so when I was in graduate school, and this is before the period of time where I was teaching high school, but I, I think everyone that I studied Catholic, uh, church history with is now either Catholic or Orthodox. So it's just sort of accepted and normal that you would sort of drift in that direction. But I think as you're you're really digging into Christian theology, you at least have to decide what you think about Catholicism. It's, it's not optional. It's not something you can ignore, especially as you go historical. Even if you decide you're really confirmed Calvinist, Calvin is figuring out his theology against this backdrop of, of late medieval, early modern Catholicism. And it's, so it is. And when you go back before that, it's the, the water that we're all swimming in. So you have to, you have to come to terms with it. You have to make sense of it. And you have to decide what you think about, you know, ha what was happening all those years. Did God just really let the church go completely adrift and astray with no guidance at all until someone showed up in the 16th century and fixed it all? You know, you have to come up with a narrative that makes sense. And I think if you are intellectually on honest and if you have a, a sense of God's action in the world and that God is involved and that God cares, it's hard to... It's hard to maintain that. And so, I don't know, I run into people, I think if you really dig into it and think about it, it, it upends things that you've taken for granted. And I think that there are people who just don't look there. They just stop themselves short because they don't want to, because it's really scary for people to start entertaining Catholic ideas. It really panics them. I mean, there are people that I used to work with that I just straight up make them nervous now because I'm Catholic and they are my friends and they like me, but they're kind of just weirded out by the whole thing. It's like I've joined a cult. So they are uncomfortable. So yeah, I think it's understandable, but it's also a place people I think avoid if they don't want to get seduced. <laughs> well, it seems, I mean, I feel like people probably can see how that might happen in theology. It might be less obvious to see how that might happen in the world of like physics and math and, and logic. But, but Matt, um, I mean, I think this is really pertinent because you've also, do some philosophy, uh, you know, as part of your, your work as well, because you can't really do science or math unless you come with the presupposition that the world makes sense and is ordered and reasonable and that we can trust our senses. And those are ideas that don't come to us from secular 
progressive modern philosophy, right? Those are just ideas that come to us from <clears throat> Catholicism. So is that part of why it came to a head for you? I don't think so. That wasn't what had an impact on me. I had, I had made it through my whole um, science education. I think like most people in, uh, in the science education world, without having to think about the basis of science. Um, you know, we tend to take the scientific information and, and the methods and absorb them without, oftentimes without having to think about the philosophy of science. I mean, I agree that in order to have, for science to make any sense, there has to be a rational world and we have to be rational beings who can make sense out of the world. You need, you need a world that's intelligible and you need intelligent human beings. Uh, but, and it's really Catholicism that, that laid the foundation of that. The other part of it is that there are still so many myths about the history of science. Uh, people, when people hear about Catholicism and science, we, we immediately, especially the American culture the public, I think, we immediately see this divide as that Catholicism is somehow antithetical to scientific thought. Uh, and it's, it's only through looking into it further that I realized that those are myths. I mean, literally historical myths that were created at the end of the 1800s. So I think that for most people in the, in the natural sciences, they can make it through and get their degrees without, without ever thinking about the uh, philosophical basis of their ideas and methods. It's funny because as you're talking, I realize how dumb of a question that was, because now that I've been in the church almost 20 years, like I just take for granted that anybody who like seriously looks at the history would be like, well, of course, the church invented the scientific method. Of course, the church discovered, you know, cell theory. Of course, the church like it's behind the discovery of like a bajillion things. There are like 14 craters on the moon named after Jesuit priests. And I, I keep forgetting that like, Relatively speaking, I've only known that for like the last half of my life, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, went yeah. to public school and I heard about all these people, you know, who are explorers, pioneers, um, either in the science or in the field of geography who went around the world and found things. And, and now that I'm Catholic, I'm like, oh, wait, that was Father Marquette. What? What? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know, or or this composer was a priest. Nobody ever told me that part. Right. You know, it is it is kind of fascinating how you can sort of skirt through those things without ever catching that piece of it even in i mean well, like i say i'm a public school product but even you know within a christian school as well but um well there are other layers of things that i want to get to here uh you know, because there was a little time between when you were thinking about it and when you pulled the trigger on this or the tr trigger was pulled on you was there a fear either in your world um or by the people who we're sending their kids to you or by your bosses or supervisors that you were like leading souls astray. Um, and I know Annie, you hinted at this in some of these cases where you were being accused of leading people astray. Did you even like consciously know that's what you were doing? Uh, no, I did not think I was leading anyone astray. I thought I was just being my Anglican self. I knew that I had some tension around certain aspects of reformed theology and it was explicitly part of my job to present both a Calvinist and an Arminian view of predestination as equally viable, equally biblical options. And that was not the easiest thing for me, but I did it so well that most kids actually walked out thinking I was Calvinist. <laughs> I was sort of like presenting it because um, I felt, I guess, a burden to do it really well because it was absolutely not my position. But I think, you know, some of the rest of what I was teaching that got me into trouble with parents was not me trying to be Catholic at all. It was me trying to accurately convey what I understood about Christianity. And I didn't think of it as being Catholic. It was sort of like, this is what I know so far. This is what I understand this biblical passage should be about. This is what I think. And we would teach things like N.T. Wright. And so as I'm explaining what N.T. Wright is saying, and he's Anglican, it's sounding very Catholic to my audience and to whatever gets translated and goes home to their parents. And so things that got me in trouble were things like the way that I would teach biblical inerrancy, which we would teach a total inerrantist position. And then we would teach a modified form of that that would allow for incidental discrepancies and this kind of thing. And 
that would go home to, to kids and someone would be on the phone to my principal saying that I was teaching the kids that there were mistakes in the Bible and that the Bible wasn't true, which is not my position, is not really what I think. But of course, a total inerrantist view the way a Christian sort of Protestant fundamentalist would, would present it is not my position either. And so, you know, I, I kind of skated a little bit on predestination, but that biblical inerrancy piece was really tough. Um, evolution was sometimes really tough going hand in hand with that. And I think it was because students were attracted to it or interested in or thought it was kind of, you know, different. They hadn't quite heard it before that they would come and talk to me about it. And then they would go home and they would want to talk about it at the dinner table. They would want to talk about, gosh, Dr. Bullock says that, you know, um, the point of our life isn't to escape to a disembodied heaven. It's to participate in God's mission on earth and then be part of the new creation after the resurrection. And their parents are, are going, I've, this is, no, this is not it. And I really just thought of myself as teaching Christianity, Christian theology in a straightforward way. Um, and then, you know, what I would get back was you're teaching our kids that grandma's not in heaven and that the Bible isn't true <laughs> and that I, God makes mistakes and God doesn't have a plan for their life and, and just sort of interrupting a lot of their, uh, I'm going to be unkind and say a lot of their theological platitudes that don't really make sense. Um, but I did, I really thought of myself as giving them a little bit more intellectual depth, not of, of making them more Catholic. Well, the, the things that you were mentioning are all part of like historic ancient Christianity for like the first three quarters of the life of the church, right? Yes. <laughs> it's in the creeds, yes. right? I believe in the resurrection of the body, right? I mean, it's, it's, in it's right in there. Or I would teach them this out of a portion of Athanasius. I love teaching on the incarnation of the word by Athanasius. So we would read parts of that and talk about, you know, the divine dilemma and the reconstitution of the, uh, the imago Dei and the human being and how that's, you know, kind of our story. And it's not about my sins are forgiven and then I get to go to heaven and, and I'm, and they're thinking, wow, this is exciting. This is interesting. There's more to this, which is exactly where I was when I was raised Baptist and I came to a place where I was like, there's nothing else here. It's very simple. It feels very flat to me. And so I would have a certain number of kids that were excited about it. But then I also would have Catholic students that would stay after class and close the door and say, okay, level with me. You're Catholic, right? <laughs> and I would say, yeah. No, sweetie, really, I'm not. I'm not. I promise. I wouldn't be able to work here if I were. I'm not Catholic. But they recognized it. They could see there was something going on there that they recognized from what they, you know, heard at church and what they knew of the Bible and and so forth. <clears throat> Matt, anything like that ever happened to you? Well, I'm, I'm just impressed that you had uh, students who were Catholics who knew their faith well enough to recognize it. I mean, that's that's encouraging to hear. You know, I... With teaching the physics and the, or I wasn't teaching physics, I was teaching math at the time, but, uh, no, I never had presentation of, uh, theological materials. The, the prayers that we would do and the, the brief devotions that I would share, I could keep ger general enough that, um, there weren't any, any problems. And I never had any parents later who said, Oh, you know, you were leading my kid astray. I never heard any accusations of that, uh, of that sort of thing. Were there any tells though? Like, were there any, would there be anything in the way that you taught or comported yourself or did things professionally that somebody might say, I don't know, man, Mr. D seems well, kind of Romish. <laughs> we had, we had faculty devotions. So each morning we would start, um, which was an, uh, optional, but most of the teachers would attend. So we'd be there in the faculty room and it would rotate who was going to lead the faculty devotion. And typically when I would lead, I found myself sharing passages from Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Akempis, some of those types of thinkers, um, reading lots of C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, you know, the gateway drugs to Catholicism. So some of the teachers may have, uh, you know, I, I think I was attending, I audited another class with Peter Kreeft, and I think some of the teachers noticed, like, my attraction to Peter Craig, and they liked him too because, you know, he was in what was it? I think Case for Faith, which was a popular book, and he was in, interviewed there. So some of the oh well, there was there was one thing I forgot about this. At one point, they did a, a like a denomination fair. So I guess one of the theology classes they had to study the different denominations, and so this one group of kids had studied Catholicism, 
And so I go over and I'm, and this was near the end of the, my last year there. So I was, I was already, um, I'd already been reunited with the church. I was attending daily mass in secret and, and I was convinced. So I'm looking at this presentation that the kids have, and there were some things on there that were plainly false about Catholicism. And so as a, as a teacher, I filled out like an evaluation card and I was like, well, they said this, I know this is this and this and this. And then the theology teacher told me later, she was like, oh, that makes sense now. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess there were a couple of those. So you things. did have a tell. You I did. Have a tell. I definitely so. did. I there were so the first time I actually had a, a concern raised about me was a student asked me in class, is C.S. Lewis a Catholic or a Christian? And I didn't hesitate at all. This was my first year and I worked there for six years. So there was quite a long time. It was my first year. And I just said, well, first of all, Catholics are Christians. And C.S. Lewis is Anglican. This is kind of an explain a little bit of why you might find that a little confusing. And I mean, there was, it wasn't major issues, but it was a conversation with my principal. It was a conversation with the parent. It was a conversation with the kid. So I would always defend the Catholic kids because one of the things that would get leveled at them is that they didn't know their faith. And they actually did. The kids that I taught at that school, the Catholic ones were very well formed, but they were, you know, if they couldn't come up with an answer to please a very aggressive and ill-informed, you know, fellow Protestant peer, uh, they would say, see, there's no answer. They don't, they don't have an answer. And I would be like, okay, time out. Just because this individual doesn't have the answer doesn't mean that the Catholic church doesn't have an answer to that. So the way that I would always defend the Catholic students and take up for them was, was probably a tell. And I could do it, that I could defend the position that I understood it well enough to say, Hey, the other thing that I did that I was, we went on a, a trip to Europe. I was chaperoning and we went to a papal audience. And I could not stop crying. <laughs> and there was a kind parent. of a giveaway. Oh, yeah, so there was a parent there who was like, oh, my goodness, Annie. She was laughing about it afterwards. And she said, that's the moment when I knew we were going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> it was about Dead that was probably me. about six months before I came in six, eight months before I came into the church. That was at the end. But there were other parents there that were very concerned by my reaction to being at a people audience. Well, we, we talk about this all the time when we talk to pastors, uh, Protestant pastors who, uh, you know, are looking to go deeper and deeper with their sermons and bring their, their, their flock, their congregation into, you know, deeper and deeper territory. And you can only do that for so long with what's going on on the Christian bestsellers list, right? And they, they go deeper and, and deeper and they find some things and, and they become deeply convicted by these things and they figure out a way to talk about them in a way that sort of overlaps with the statements of belief that they themselves have signed for their own denominations. But, uh, you know, they very often talk about that fear, that um, kind of trepidation that, you know, what's going to happen to me if I take one more step in this direction? Uh, did you have any of that, Matt? Like, what's going to happen to me? Like, if I move any further, is am I going to be the one who breaks the ice or is somebody going to break it on me? Like, I mean, were you were you in that tension where you weren't sure whether you were going to be in a position to make a decision for yourself in this regard or if somebody was going to make that decision for you? Like, how'd that work out? As I was investigating... I was so convinced that Catholicism was wrong that I wasn't going to have that problem. Uh, and, but, and I couldn't, it was too late. By the time I realized that I was able to defend the church to myself, it, it was already, I was like, Oh, well, here, here I am. I sort of, I found myself standing on Catholic ground and I, I looked back and I realized, Oh, well, here I am. I, you know, the, the questions are, are solved, but that's, that's the point when, I looked at my school situation and I had to start wondering. And so it was during that year that I, my last year there that I, I, re I realized, I figured out that I wasn't going to be coming back unless the board gave me a, a special dispensation. And they, um, I think they wanted to, to, there was like kind of a small group of people that I met with and they were, I could tell they all felt badly that they all, they didn't want this situation to happen, that they were going to have to let the teacher go. Um, or as they rephrase it, renew my contract because I was Catholic, but by the the guidelines that were laid out for the school, they just didn't have a choice. Um, so thankfully, I, uh, as I was coming to that point, I was on good terms with, with the people that were involved. Uh, so there was, there was no animosity around at all. Um, but going, you know, going into the meeting, there was some trepidation. I knew where I stood 
I, I wasn't sure. I doubted they were going to make a, um, you know, uh, a decision to allow me to stay. But yeah, of course. Yeah, I was the lead here. These are not individual decisions either. I mean, you guys both have families, no. <laughs> right? So this is part of it too. Uh, how about you, Annie? I I thought I was in trouble. I thought I was. I thought I was going to get fired at some point. <laughs> Um, not necessarily, like I said, I was just kind of thought I was presenting a historical Christianity and I thought I was fine, but I was the parent complaints about my class were, which were never about me as a person. They were always like, Oh, we love you. You're great. But, um, Oh goodness. The devil is using you. I was told that more than once the devil is using you to sow seeds of doubt in the, in the lives of these children. And so it was just the temperature was and I did not feel like uh, they, my administration was sort of willing to defend me up to a point. And then they they then they were not. And so there was a couple of parents. There were a couple of parents that would call other parents and tell them you know, what was going on in my class and this and that. And there was one meeting I had with a parent with my principal where she cried and told me that I was the reason her son was an atheist. And there was kind of a lot going on that I thought, this isn't, they're either going to move me out of theology and just have me teach literature or history or something, or I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to stay here. And I don't know that it's going to be, that it's going to be my decision. I just always kind of thought at the same time that, well, we have Orthodox faculty because we did. And but none of them were teaching theology and orthodoxy just always people have a different impression of it i think they don't evangelicals i think don't understand it in quite you know the same my theory way. as to why i can tell you why i would love um, to know your theory because i think it's weird so, uh, i went to asbury college now asbury university um in the news recently for its revivalistic um things that have been happening down there uh but oh, i had some friends who got into these worlds of history and liturgy and sacramental theology and first of all, we were in Kentucky, so there was only one Catholic church around. So there were some other options within Anglicanism and Orthodoxy. So some people with the Anglican route because, you know, Anglican C.S. Lewis was an Anglican. Dorothy Sayers was an Anglican. Mad Madeline Lingle was an Anglican. You can – a safe space. But some of my friends with Orthodox because Orthodoxy believes the exact same things as Catholicism on almost everything except your mom – won't freak out about you worshiping Mary because your mom doesn't know what the word Theotokos means. So that's the real thing. If you want to know. That is how I felt about it. Cause we had, there were several and I, I thought, well, th that's fine. Why wouldn't me being sort of this Catholic leaning Anglican be fine? But I did, there was so much pressure. The parents, there were a handful of parents, like I said, that were just kind of after me that I thought this isn't going to end well. And there had been a guy who was maybe like a fourth grade teacher that I heard a rumor, totally unsubstantiated, that the reason he didn't return was because he told them he'd entered RCIA. Um, and I've never asked him that. I see him occasionally at mass, but I, I, I've never asked him. But I heard that and it freaked me out. And I asked my supervisor, not my principal, but my immediate supervisor, what would happen? Like, what would happen if I entered RCIA? Like, what would that look like? And he said, well, you shouldn't tell anyone. And probably it would go better for you if you weren't a theology teacher. And I thought, okay, I will not be doing that. All right. Well, um, I, we've gotten to like the part where you're all terrified and, uh, you know, waiting for the Protestant Inquisition to come and seize you and, you know, and all these horrible things, you know, that, you know, of course, you, you both have spoken about like, these are like really good people in your lives, right? These are people who like, you know, treated you very well and, you know, wanted to follow Christ. And so the only reason they had those clauses in there is because they were trying to protect people from things that they thought might lead them away from Christ, right? Um, I think it's important to understand those motivations. Uh, but before we get past your, you know, your trepidation and fear and, and angst and anxiety and get into like kind of where the hope comes in for both of your stories, in case there is a Christian school teacher in a situation like yours watching right now, Who's like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how credible these witnesses are, how, you know, how really into Christian schools they were. What's something that only somebody who's taught at a private Christian school could possibly understand? What's an experience of being in a private Christian school that is so unique to that kind of like world and that bubble that only another 
Christian school teacher might be able to understand. Anybody got one? Well, I mean, the faculty devotions was something that I've never seen anywhere else. The fact that there would be that kind of, uh, you know, faculty led thing in the morning. Um, yeah, we had well, that. even the fact you call it devotions too, right? I mean, that's a right. that's a kind of uniquely Protestant way to describe Bible study, right? Devotions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what might be uh, might be in the world that I would think of. Uh, yeah. You probably didn't have. Well, depending on what your athletic situation was, you probably didn't have cheerleaders, or maybe you did, and they wore like full body well, suits. They had very long skirts. Yeah, <laughs> starting to think. I, I, you know, I'm, yeah, I, I was have, a public school we kid. We had sports where there were cheerleaders. I don't think there was no football team. I don't think the basketball team had. Um, I mean, one thing that they would often do is is pray before a game, but that's not necessarily uniquely. Uh, you do right. that in the South all the time in public school, man. <laughs> so. I live in Texas. I know all about that. Uh, yeah. Even the atheists know. say the Lord's Prayer at the end of a football game. So We had a verse for the year um, that was picked by the head of school, and it was kind of the, the theme verse of the year, and it often went along with the theme verse for the football season. They often had a – I'm in Texas, so we have a football team, but uh, a theme verse for – and a kind of a, a spiritual theme for the year because they think of athletics and everything else as being part of their, um, part of their Christian identity, I guess. Yeah. I didn't know if maybe like during basketball warmups, instead of playing jock jams, like you're, uh, they played DC talk over the head speakers or like, or whatever, or something like, I, I don't know. I was just trying to think of like the subcultural stuff that might be a part of this, but all we right. We had weekly chapel, weekly chapel. So, there you go. which was like a, which was like a church service there would be worship students and a couple teachers up there to lead worship and then basically a sermon from a guest speaker or one of the other teachers or something like that all right well let's get into some hope all right when you got kicked to the curb uh first of all tell me the exact circumstances of how it all ended and then tell me where you landed uh we'll start with you matt so like i said i had turned in this document, this really quite vague personal theological statement saying, I can't agree with everything there. This is where I am. So the, there was this small group of board members who pulled me in and they tried to as gently as they could. I'm sure they recognized how, how nervous I was at the time. Just said, what's going on? And I just explained very simply my, my position that, you know, for a while I've been investigating Catholicism, trying to prove it wrong, and I'm now at a point where I, I cannot deny its truth. And they, uh, and no, nobody freaked out, and they said, "Well, what, what in particular?" They wanted to know what in particular I couldn't agree with. What, like, could I say the the doctrines that I couldn't agree with? And I forget what I said, except I remember the thing about the the books of the Bible because that's clear. Like, that's not really open to interpretation. Like, well, I interpret the number 66 this way. No, it's, that's, that's a number. It's quantifiable. You can't argue with that one. Uh, and I left, I left the meeting being pretty sure that that's, you know, that they weren't going to allow me to come back. Uh, so I had been, I had started studying philosophy classes at a local college. And so that's where I ended up. Just studying, continuing to finish studying philosophy. Um, my wife and I had two foster children at the time, so we were getting like a little bit of an income from that, uh, enough for me to get by. And then I was hired mid-year to teach physics in a, in a public school. Um, so that, that was something I didn't realize at the time, that having a physics degree meant that I was pretty much guaranteed a job at a school because those, those teachers are hard to find. And I was able to, and so they ask, they have to say things like in the, in the interviews, they have to say, um, is there, have you ever been let go from a position? It's like, well, actually, yes. <laughs> and so the guy who's interviewing me is like, so what exactly was that about? And I had, I was like, I'm sorry to say it was denominational differences. He's like, not an issue here. Okay. Um, so I landed on my feet in that world. Very cool. How about you, Annie? Uh, so I decided to leave on my own and there were, there were a couple of reasons, but 
the increasing pressure around theology, it was really amping up in the community and it was, some of it at least was directed, at least at my class, let's say, if not at me personally. Um, and I do appreciate you saying that these are very, they're well-intentioned people. They were very kind. I taught many of their children. It was not a personal thing. It was just, they were afraid of, of the direction of things. I decided to leave as I was looking for another job. So my degrees are in theology. I cannot teach public school. My undergraduate degree is in English and that's how I was teaching, you know, literature or whatever. The public school is not interested in that. And I do not look like a good candidate for most of what they do. I certainly applied for those jobs, but I, I never heard back. So I was trying to see if I could find another private school that would hire me to teach English. And I applied to Catholic schools and non-Catholic schools and this and that and the other. And I ended up getting a position as the English department chair at a, another school in town that was Baptist. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to walk away from teaching theology at least for a while, but this is maybe going to be a better place for me. And so I made the decision and I didn't really, in terms of the reasons that I told them that I was leaving, there were a number, number of reasons. I didn't really get into this piece. I just let it, I let it lie and sort of, I did say that I was really worn out by all of the scrutiny that my class had been under and that I wanted to step away from that. And that is directly related to my path toward Catholicism, but I didn't choose to broach that topic with, with anybody at my previous, at that school. In a lot of ways, both of you um, kind of reflect, and this is why I want to have this conversation and discuss you in the context of primaries, right? Because primaries are, as I said at the top, people whose jobs can be jeopardized by their exploration of Catholicism. And everybody thinks of pastors, Right. And pastors very often fall into, well, a lot of different categories, but but definitely the two you mentioned, um, the person who's asked to leave because um, what they're saying is is drifting towards Catholicism and the person who's like, I've just come to a pressure point and I'm not even going to say why. I'm just going to say it's better that we go our separate ways. And then a year or two passes and they become Catholic. <laughs> right. I mean, these are, these are issues that I don't think people realize are, are as pertinent as they are for for Christian high school. And well, I mean, it was high school in you guys' cases. Uh, teachers, but also, you know, elementary and middle school. I mean, you can get away with more, more probably in elementary school, uh, less in middle, but uh, definitely less than either of those in, in high school. But um, let's talk directly. In case there are people who are listening, uh, watching, who are in the situation where, that you were in, right? When you were, you, things were coming to a head, like you started to go down this road and, and you realize where that road might be taking you. Maybe perhaps you even realized it too late, like Matt did. Uh, Matt, like, what would you say to somebody who like, is like, oh no, I'm in trouble to maybe give them like a word of encouragement or maybe like a little bit of hope, um, that, that, that this doesn't have to be like a career ending debacle that will destroy their family and their future employment prospects. Like what might you say to them? Yeah. I mean, you never know what exactly what the situation is where someone's going to be able to, to turn out. Um, but I was, the thing that kind of, that kept me going was knowing just knowing that I had to be honest. Not that I had to tell the whole world. Like, you know, like and like you had said, that wouldn't be wise. Like, hey everybody, this is what I'm thinking. Bad idea. But I mean with with trusted people just to ask the right questions. But you know, I was at the at the start of it I was committed to one thing and that was what is the truth. I wanted to know the truth at all costs. Um, and and that meant something at that point. It really was it was going to test. Did I mean this truth, truth at all costs? Um, but to not give up on that, that that, that is a greater treasure than, um, than remaining at, at the school where I happen to be teaching. I love that school and I wish I could stay. I like the, I like the community. I like the people. Um, but, but it didn't, it didn't work out. Uh, but I would say that the, the treasure that I have found in, in Catholicism, and in the Catholic Church was was worth it. Um, I had, at one point along the way, I had this really bad thought that, and I remember sitting in church thinking this, like, well, I'm, I'm going to a non-denominational church. Maybe I could just continue going to this church and be uh, Catholic in my theology, but I'm still going to this evangelical Protestant church. But immediately, 
I was like, that's a terrible idea. Why would you think that? Uh, because primarily because of, um, because of the Eucharist. If, if I thought Catholicism was true, then that would mean that I thought Christ was really present in the Eucharist. And what in the world would keep me away from that? From receiving him, his body, blood, soul, and divinity in, in the Eucharist. So that's, that's where my eye was focused and that's what kept me going in that direction. And I, I didn't know where I was going to land. Um, but, but I just had to keep myself focused. So that's what I would, I would recommend is, um, you know, start to explore, ask questions where you can without revealing anything that would be imprudent. But at the same time, uh, stay focused on what is, what is the goal in our, in our spiritual life in terms of intellectual honesty. And I can see it's, it would be difficult for somebody in that position because it's intellectual honesty that has led somebody to the point of realizing Catholicism. So then to be um, deceitful about it, just doesn't, uh, just doesn't make sense. It really rubs the wrong way. But it's funny you mentioned that idea of being Catholic theologically, but not actually have to, you know, pull the trigger. I mean, it's so preposterous to think about being Catholic theologically and like never receiving the sacraments, you know, like you, it's kind of <laughs> like, how do you do yeah. that? And, you know, I, I remember, um, being in that, in that phase and, and and later on discovering the passage from the catechism that says something, I can't even remember where it is, um, uh, where about like, you know, it's it's next to the piece of inv- on invincible ignorance where it's talking about like, you know, anyone who knowing that the church is the true church founded by Christ and then like willfully refusing to participate in it, you know, that's like its own form of, <laughs> form of a problem, right? Um, and... You know, looking back, I, I I remember what that felt like. So yeah, I can identify with that totally. How about you, Annie? What kind of uh, encouragement might you give to somebody? Yeah, I mean, I identify with that too because I really think I thought I had Catholicism. I'd been interested in it for a long time, but it, I had it was sort of like a pet. I had it on a leash. It, it's you know, it's a tiger, so it's not going to stay on a leash. Uh, but I at the time thought, no, this is fine. I've gone far enough. We're okay. Uh, and I didn't really, well, I did really love the school that I was in and I loved the community and I, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to leave for this sake or, or whatever it is. And I mean, I think it's quite possible to be in the middle of something and going through it and not really understand what's going on with you and not really understand until you look back. Because at the time I really, I thought it was okay. I had my Catholicism right there. It's my little pet and I'm hanging out and I'm doing the right thing. And when people would come at me and and tell me, you know, I really feel like our kids are being, you know, seduced by Catholicism and it's under your influence. And I would be like, what are you talking about? No, absolutely not. And I look back and I think, yeah, kind of. I mean, I, I was definitely leading that direction. And that part was okay. I agree with you about, uh, Matt, about uh, deception. There's no need for it to, to be deceitful. It's okay for it to be a little bit of a messy process. But when you make the leap, it's a leap into you can trust it. I did not know what was going to happen to me when I left and I was teaching English, which is not my main area in, in a Baptist school. And I didn't ask their permission either. I just sort of asked around and found out there were a few other Catholic teachers and we decided to go for it. And then after the fact, I kind of said, it's okay if I'm Catholic, right? And they were like, yeah, sure. As long as you're signing the statement of faith, which actually you can justify the numbers to yourself, you know, because it's at least 66 books. <laughs> That's a great out, by the way, in that contract. I'm not saying I love this, but I, for two years, went ahead and signed that thing. So, you know, I didn't stay there, though. And I, I think I had sort of a series of experiences that propelled me out from there. And I worked in the parish for a year and then I landed at a Catholic school and the situation that I am in now is in all ways better. It is, but it is a path I never could have predicted. If you told me you're, you're going to leave and teach English in a Baptist school, and that's only going to be for two years, and you're going to become Catholic while you're doing that, and then you're going to be a youth minister in a parish for one year, and then you're going to be the director of campus ministry at this, I would have, I mean, no. I just would not have thought that that was possible or that any of that was going to happen. And so I think 
There's, there's, you can trust in, in that God has a path. And I'm not saying that he has had that planned out from before eternity, but rather that as you're moving, God can direct your steps and you will, you will land somewhere. And the skills that you have from whatever you've been teaching, like you were talking about being a physics teacher, you may not have known that that meant that you were a great candidate for, for public schools. There are just things that doors that God can open that are going to be the right direction for you. And when you get there, you, it will be in a place of more honesty. It will be in a place that is more authentic and natural to you. And, you know, even now, when we first started attending a, the Catholic parish where we came into the church, I would hear them say, Father would say, um, blessed are those who are called to the Supper of the Lamb. And I would think, and I still think, that's me. That's me. I'm called. I'm called to the Supper of the Lamb. I'm I'm the one being called. Even before we were in, in in the church and able to receive. And I still think it every time I hear it, God was calling me and I can trust that the path, it might be bumpy, but it's going to lead to some more beautiful. Well, and the, the other piece of encouragement, uh, because, you know, I haven't mentioned in the course of this, that I'm married to a Catholic educator too. Uh, so this is, you know, the past 20 years of my life have been, you know, kind of adjacent to this world. And I've picked up all kinds of interesting things. One of which uh, along the way is that, Catholic schools are always looking for good people to come in. And if you have a skill that made you a good teacher at a private Christian school and you want to go become Catholic, I know a gajillion Catholic schools that would love to have someone like you um, who loves the Lord and who wants to, you know, teach the faith um, or teach physics from a perspective of faith, right? Any of this stuff. Um, go coach a football team. Go do teach PE, right? Go any of this stuff. Like Catholic schools would love to have people like you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's an incredible thing to be able to be a part of. And, uh, if you've got a passion for, for education and a love for the Lord, I mean, that's, that's a big, a big draw <laughs> for a lot of schools all over the country. So, uh, before I let you go, uh, any, why don't you let us know what you're up to, uh, now and maybe where people can find your stuff. We'll start with you, Matt. I write, on a somewhat regular basis, I write some blogs for the National Catholic Register. Um, I have a YouTube channel that I sometimes update with latest videos. Um, we got some books available. So the thing, the door for me, not being science, was philosophy, right? And so philosophy is um, where my area of recent study has been. Hoping to pursue a PhD soon once I get some paperwork worked out in that area. So that's what's then you'll going be on. Dr. D. Yeah, 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 and then it will be even more Doctor D, Doctor B, even more similar. That's worse. But I've got, I think I've yeah, got a few years. So. Yeah, I'll uh, put a link to some of your uh, your books. Um, they're really kind of handy, and they're actually written for for like high school audiences. Yeah, uh, some of that stuff, um, as well as your Nath National Catholic Register um, material. You've written articles periodically for them, pun intended. Uh, and then uh, Annie, um, what you're up to now? Oh, so I, I mean, I'm working as director of campus ministry at a Catholic high school in Austin. And I also, our diocese requires that I have a master's degree from a Catholic university. So I have a master's and a PhD, but they're not from a Catholic university. So I'm getting another master's. So that's fun. Um, and I'm finishing that up. I just uh, handed in a draft of, of my thesis, which is about Trinitarian theology as a resource for thinking about Catholic education. So I've got that. Um, I don't know. I haven't been doing very much writing, so I have nothing to say on that. Well, you're not a real teacher unless you also go to school yourself <laughs> for most of your life. So yeah. I found that out mm -hmm. as well. Uh, well, I'm so glad that we've had this conversation. I'm so glad that both of you agreed to do this. I'm so glad that there's some nuances of this story that, that you were both able to bring out that I hope really are helpful, especially to anybody watching right now who, who might be in this kind of situation and wondering what the next step might be. Um, Dr. Andy Bullock, Matt D'Antuono, thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching this episode of Coming Home Network Presents. Again, check us out at chnetwork.org. Uh, check out our online community as well if you want to plug in and have conversations with other people who are also on this journey of faith, uh, exploring Catholicism. That's community.chnetwork.org. And of course, it's all made possible by generous people who want to help people like you. Um, and if you want to join that team of generous supporters, go to chnetwork.org slash donate. I'm Matt Swaim. Thank you again. We'll talk to you next time.